Now, while I am a city boy by birth, I am a country boy by heart. I am a son of a farmer, the grandson of a farmer, the great-grandson of a farmer whose father and father's father were all farmers. I come from a long pedigree of farmers. In fact, I am really the first of my kind in my family in that I was not born nor raised on the farm. I can say, though, that my agricultural ancestors bleed through my pores and live, or I live vicariously through them. I find myself, for example, getting goosebumps every time I hear Paul Harvey's rendition of And God Created a Farmer. I find myself tapping my toes to John Denver's Thank God I'm a Country Boy. And I find myself romanticizing about being away on the back 40, cutting hay, mending fence, and chopping wood. Chances are, when you go to lunch today and eat, you are going to eat food produced by a farmer. If you do not, you'll probably get cancer because your food has been cooked up in some lab by chemicals. So farming is so central to the fabric of our fruited plain, whether we know it or not. And it most certainly would have been central to Paul's life and that of his Galatian listeners when seven And out of every 10 people you bumped into on the street in the first century would have some agricultural job as their career. So it is not shocking then as our eyes gazed on Galatians 6, 6 through 10, that a farming metaphor dominates this section. Pictures of sowing and reaping, laboring and sweating, working and resting are all on the life of the farmer. Now, why is Paul doing this? Just by way of review, he is finishing up his letter to the Galatians. And he has spent at least five chapters of the six trying to do his desperate earnest to plead and persuade the church to return to this precious gospel, as he unpacks it in Galatians, that once upon a time God made a promise to Abraham to produce a family, and the only way into that family is by a work of another, not our own. And we trust in that work of another whose faithfulness brings us into that family. And Paul is throwing out everything but the kitchen sink rhetorically in Galatians to do it. He has argued from personal experience, with rhetoric, with theological foundations. Now in chapter 6, which is so standard for Paul, He ends his letters with pastoral exhortations. It's beautiful and marvelous. So right out of the gate in verse 1 of chapter 6, he begins to conclude all of his argument, and now Pastor Paul begins to plead for his congregations to remember and do something as a body of Christ. Remember, when he writes this, he's unsure if these churches will come back to the gospel, they are being infiltrated with a works righteous, go back to Mosaic law syndrome, which only creates disaster. So Paul began last week by saying, look, you are going to know quickly if you are a gospel-centered church or a works 
Christ-centered church. You're going to know, if Paul were our pastor, Calvary, you're going to know really quick if we are led by the Spirit or if we're led by the flesh, something he ends chapter 5 and pivots to chapter 6 on. Well, how will you know? Will you know because we write good doctrinal statements? Will we know because we answer in Sunday school the right answers? Those are appropriate, but for Paul here, you're going to know if you're a gospel-centered, spirit-filled church or not by how you behave to one another, how you live your lives to one another, because that's where theology lives. That's where doctrine really lives is how you go live it one another in the family. And so Paul's going to say, we're going to see if we really mean business, if you're a gospel-centered church by how you behave. And he leads in chapter 6 last week by how you behave spiritually with one another. Namely, when we sin, how do we treat sinners? Because someone that lives by the gospel does it in a completely different way versus a legalist committed to works righteousness. Ever been in a legalistic church when you sin? You know how you're treated. And Paul says, you're going to know now how you're treated in a gospel. So treat one another by spirit-led in sin. Now he says the same thing in verses 6 through 10 in a different way. There, he says, you'll know if you're a gospel-centered church, if you're a spirit-led church, by how you treat one another materially, physically, socially, how you give to one another through real, nitty-gritty, everyday needs. So much of the gospel is seen and heard. It's proclaimed to sinners, but it's also seen Brothers and sisters, when we take a deacon's benevolent fund or here in a month when we celebrate Walk to the Manger and we can give to two local organizations in our church for the gospel's sake. In other words, it's not only seen doctrinally, but it's also seen in our hands and feet. And that's what Paul gets at today. Now, he does it through a farming metaphor. So what I'm going to ask you to do is mentally... Get a picture of a farm, okay? We're going green acres. So just in your mind, think of a farm. Get dressed, bib overhauls, denim, cowboy boots. Maybe, I don't know, we listen to George Strait and drive our pickup truck and, you know, put a little red man in our lip. I don't know how, whatever visual you have, we're on the farm now. And the first thing we do on a farm is we work. Because if you don't work on a farm, you're not going to have the farm very long. Um, I had the luxury of spending summers with my grandparents. They were farmers. So I do all my, as a kid, before I started to work, I'd spend months with them, most of the summer. Now, my grandparents lived primitively. We did not have indoor plumbing. So we had a thing called an outhouse uh, that you went to. And we, they did not have air conditioning or furnace, right? So you opened up your windows or you closed them and you lit a wood stove. They did not have TV or any social media. How did I survive? I don't know how, but we did. And so it was actually, uh, for me as a city kid, living with them, an absolute joy because it was like a field trip every day. I I worked and they looked at me like a a, a hand. They didn't have to pay me. They just fed me. But I I did all the heavy heavy lifting in in their older years. And I would do a lot of chores before breakfast. I didn't mind getting up that early. You would think as a kid, I didn't mind getting up early and go feeding the chickens and milking. And then I'd come back for breakfast and it was always a big breakfast. Bacon and eggs every day. We're told that will slam your left ventricle shut, but that was vitamins for them. And my grandparents lived in their 90s and ate fried eggs and bacon every day of their life. And after breakfast, then grandpa would tell me stories. And at some point, he would always say, okay, Brizey, daylight's a-wasting. 
If I heard that once, I heard it a thousand times. And that was his way of saying, we got to get to work. And from dawn to dusk, you worked. And there was always work to be done on a farm. (laughs) And so right out of the gate, Paul is saying, in the farm of God, the church, there is always work to be done. And some of you may get tired of doing it. We're going to get to that. But there's always work to be done in the church of God. And the predominant work, Paul wants to make sure we make great priority. It's mentioned three times in this section. It's the term, do good. So that's our main task on God's farm. Okay, so the one thing to keep this farm afloat, the church of God, our responsibility, everybody's a farmer. If you name the name of Jesus, everyone's got work. We all know what our main job is. Do good. Now, I have heard the the, uh, vernacular do-gooder. So I did my due diligence and looked up in the dictionary what a do-gooder is. And it is not a compliment. Webster's Dictionary defines a do-gooder as an earnest, though naive, humanitarian. The Heritage Dictionary defines a do-gooder as a naive idealist who supports humanitarian causes. And then the Oxford Dictionary says that do-gooder is an informal, usually disparaging term referring to a well-intentioned person, though naive and impractical. Now that doesn't sound too complimentary. But yet Paul says, I want you to be a do-gooder. And it dominates our section. Verse 6, share all good things. Verse 9, Don't grow weary in doing good. Verse 10, do good to all. So the theme is inescapable. We are to do good. Now, Paul doesn't specify a whole lot of what that means. We can start by saying what it does not mean is if God through Paul says to do good in the body, then we shouldn't be doing bad. So that liberates us that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you don't have to go to the Father and pray. Now, Heavenly Father, what is your will for me today? Should I treat my neighbor unkindly today? Help me to know your wisdom. Should I talk about my brother behind his back and tear him down? Is is that, give me discernment to know if that's the right thing to do. Should I hurt that person who's hurt me. I really want to. I think the Spirit's leading me to do that. Can I do that? We never have to pray such prayers. Why? Because the exhortation to do good and the opposite of doing good is bad, which is not in the cards. That's not our job. So then we have the priority to do good, mentioned three times. We are to maximize doing good, minimize doing bad. And one other thing, notice in the text the expanse of our goodness. When I was on my grandparents' farm, it would not have been beneficial for my grandpa to tell me, Brian, go cut hay. (laughs) Okay, I, I don't know where you want. But my grandpa would say, Brian, go to the 80 and cut hay or go to the 40 and cut A, or go to the third. He would give me an expanse, a space of what I was to do and where I was to do it. And guess what? The Apostle Paul tells us where we're to do good at. Verse 10, we're to do good to all people. So there's your field. There's your job. You're to do good, not bad, and you're to do it to all people. And given the fact of the all people and the contrast that comes next, we can get a sense of who all the people are. All people are believers and unbelievers. Those who will appreciate you doing good to them and those who will take advantage of you. 
we're to do good to all people. So again, we don't have to pray, God, uh, help me to know who to do good to. Is it the person that's a jerk to me or not? No, we're to do good to everybody. So those are the general exhortations. Prioritize goodness, minimize badness, and the scope of your labor of doing good is to all men. Now, Paul provides scenarios on how to do this. So the exhortation is to do good. So there are three exhortations in this section. One is do, two or don't. And they're all surrounded on this concept of good. Do good. Do good, not bad, to everybody. Now Paul begins to specify a little bit more how to to prioritize our goodness. First, in verse 10, we're to do good, not bad. We're to do good at all times, in all places, to all people, but especially to members of the church family. That's how Paul ends verse 10, doesn't he? So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially to those who belong to the family of faith. The only time that Paul breaks his farming metaphor with family. And we know, because we're all in families, that our main priority is to our family. We provide for our family first. We protect our family first. We're responsible for our kids first. And now Paul says in the body, your main priority of doing good is to look across the seat, to look across the aisle in the hallway. And here at Calvary, that is your number one priority of who you do good to is members of the family. And in this way, beloved, Paul is simply mirroring Jesus. You remember as Jesus prepares to die, he meets in the upper room. John devotes five chapters. In fact, half of John's gospel, the last half is all the last week of Jesus. It's remarkable in its detail. And about five chapters are committed to the upper room where Jesus sort of gives his last will and testament. And do you remember what he says to his disciples? He says, the world will know that you follow me by what? By you having a great evangelistic campaign, a great marketing strategy, being nice to people. I mean, all those aren't good, but that's not what Jesus says. The world will know you're my disciples if you love one another the most convincing case to unbelievers living in a bad world is to see good people who actually love to be around one another and they ordinarily wouldn't be around one another because they're all different from different backgrounds, different racial, economic, political. Why on earth this wacky thing called the church do people from all ages and all different walks of life get together, get along? Jesus says, It's love. And in this bad world with bad people, when they see good people sharing goodness, that is an attraction. Equally so, it is a destruction of the gospel if we see in Corinth when churches don't do that. They tend to decrease in their evangelistic fervor. This seems to be a New Testament ethic because the author of Hebrews would say later, let us learn to stir up to one another love and good works. Um, God wants us to do good to one another. And this goodness of one another is reflected in the previous chapter with the fruits of the Spirit. So we should be seen to be loving one another, to be happy to be around one another, to keeping harmony with one another, to tolerating one another, to being gentle with one another, and to pulling others' needs or putting others' needs before our own. So do good. Do good to all men. Do good to all men, not badness, but especially in the church. And now within the church, Paul leads this section with a subgroup that's found in the family. Verse 6. Now, Let me give a parental advisory 
before I get into verse 6. Um, I'm always with great trepidation when I approach verses like this uh, to be quite careful not to be misinterpreted that I'm now going to use this as a battering ram to air my grievances against you. Uh, so let me just say, I am well taken care of by Calvary. Before we get into it, I don't want you to think, hmm, hmm, what is this subliminal? Uh, uh, so Paul now begins a subset within the body of who particularly you're to do good to. And what is the link of these two groups is the word of God. This is absolutely important, particularly to what Paul is facing in Galatians, because I think he's writing about his own situation where he's not being treated good as a teacher by the church. And the link here is the word of God. The element that produces healthy and strong churches is the word of God. You will always know if you visit churches if it is a strong church or if it's a weak church by how the word of God is viewed and practiced. And if the word of God is anywhere but central, if it is the periphery of the church, bad things will happen. There is, it's not an accident, beloved, that there are some churches that have regular perennial problems and other churches that do not. That is not an accident. That is a direct application because one practices the centrality of the word of God and the other gives lip service to it. Kind of like the king of England. He's just the titular authority, but the prime minister is the real authority. Many churches treat the word of God that way. They say the word of God is central, but then see how they behave one toward another. And you'll soon find out if they believe that the Bible's worth the paper it's printed on. So what's very important here and what's at stake is the word of God should be priority. And if it's priority to your church members, then those who give it to you ought to be treated good and well because God has given them as gifts of the church to what does Paul say here? Instruct the church in the word of God coming from the word that we get the word catechism or catechumen from, this catecheo, meaning to instruct, to explain for application, to guide you in the word. Now, all of us in every trade have teachers, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a mechanic, someone had to take time to teach you the trade. And if they were good, you never forget them. Paul says, look, church, you didn't get where you're at by accident. It wasn't like a little cube where just add water and poof, you're a Christian. But God gave the church teachers to instruct. And some of those teachers will give up their life in order to spend the rest of their life studying and praying for the church. And those teachers in particular should be treated well by the church. Most commentators, of course, take this to mean financial goodness. The word here, by the way, share, comes from the famous Greek word koinonia, common goods, that what is mine is yours. That, by the way, is the difference between Christianity and socialism. Socialism says, what is yours is mine. Christianity says, what's mine is yours. And here, that's the koinonia, that God has given you physical resources to share with those who've provided you spiritual ones, teaching the word of God. Now, I think, personally, this goes beyond just financial provisions. When it says share all good things, that may be encouragement, that may be prayer, but it certainly is to be provided, the church will give good things to their teachers to the degree they prioritize the word of God. That is the whole point of verse seven. Because if you don't, you're trying to trick God and, and saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. You're deceiving yourself. 
Because what one sows, they reap. That's the economic word for you get what you pay for. And if you really, really prioritize the word of God, then you should treat those who teach you the word of God with great priority. If you don't, it says what you think of the word of God. I remember hearing uh, a story of a circuit riding preacher in the 18th century on the East Coast. He, when he was in his 20s, took up a pastorate of a local church and he felt God called him to this church. He fell in love with them and he began preaching. And for all accounts that I have heard of this young man, uh, was the next George Whitfield. Phenomenal uh, oratory that built this church into spiritual health and led many to Christ. But over the years, uh, his church that he pastored took him for granted. He poured himself into his messages, but they no longer reciprocated that by treating him well. To the point that he had to go out and get other work. And the only work he knew, he wasn't a tradesman, is preaching. So during the week, he became a circuit-riding preacher. He got a horse, got on his horse, and went from village to village to preach. And it turned out that those listening to him uh, appreciated him more than his church members did because they weren't getting the, the word like that in their churches. And they began to pay him to come to this town, and he used that money to support himself. But in every account I've read about this guy, there was, uh, he had a reputation for being disheveled physically. He wore old clothes. His hair was unkept. He looked physically frail, that he hadn't eaten well. And what made it so mysterious is the horse that he owned was one of the top pristine horses of that frontier on the eastern seaboard. It was well kept, it was stout, it was strong, it was disease free. And so he got this reputation, go hear this guy preach, he's amazing, but he's unkept, he's un but look at his horse, it's phenomenal. This guy could get a killing by selling it. And finally, he goes back to the church he pastored that had taken him for granted. And one church member after Sunday morning comes with their concerns just what he wants to hear. And they share their concern for him. And they said, Pastor, we've noticed something we're concerned about. We notice you have a nice, fine, pristine, clean, strong horse. But we look at you, your broken down body, your unkept, your clothes are old and tattered. Why is this? He said, because the eye take care of the horse, and you take care of me. I think this is what Paul is getting at, because Paul had not been taken care of by the Galatians. In fact, I think these two specifics, verse 6 and verse 10, verse 10 about making sure you take care of one another first, and then your teachers are indicative of the Galatian problem. Paul had gone to southern Galatia, his very first missionary journey out of the gate, being sent from the church of Antioch. Three years he spent with these people, leading them to Christ. He fathered them in the faith, planting a dozen churches in south Galatia, preaching the word. It's a fruitful ministry. They're going to do well. He gets back to Antioch, and as soon as he's preparing to go to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem council, he hears the churches are breaking down because these Judaizers are coming in. And when they come in, what happens? The word of God, the gospel, ceases to be priority. Works righteousness take over. And when that happens, what occurs in the body? All you have to do is go read chapter 5. Biting and devouring one another. Jealous of one another. It's a mess. No one can stand one another. And then more germane to our point, what do they do to Paul, their teacher? Because they've ceased to prioritize the word of God. Now, Paul says... He is being questioned that he's even an apostle 
People are calling him a false teacher, an upstart, a Johnny-come-lately. So much so that he wonders, it was a waste to spend three years with you. So I think part of this is written out of his own experience that, look, if we really want to put the gospel on display, treat everybody good, especially one another, and especially those who teach you. Here calls into my mind the famous John Wesley ethic. Maybe you've heard of it. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all places you can, at all times you can, to all people you can, as long as you ever can. So that's the first exhortation. That's the meat of the sermon. Do good. Now we get into some don'ts. And they are connected to this do-gooderism on the farm. The first or the second exhortation is don't be deceived. That's verse 7 attached to the exhortation of verse 6. And the implication is some of you may be deceived. Literally, don't be tricked. Don't trick yourself. Don't trick yourself into thinking, based upon the context here, verse 6, That if I do not prioritize the word of God, we can have a healthy gospel church to do so. And that is commensurate to how you treat your teachers. To do so is to make God out to be a fool, as if he doesn't know what he's talking about by giving you the gospel in the first place. And I'm here to tell you, don't be deceived. Here's the farming metaphor. We're back on the farm. Harvest day is coming. And if there's one date on the farmer's calendar that he loves more than Christmas, it's harvest time. A farmer will work 50 weeks out of the year to have two weeks of harvest, but his entire year is built on those two weeks. And depending on what harvest he gets will be determinative if he has a job next year or if he can feed his family. So it is survival on the farm. And Paul is saying, don't be deceived, church. Harvest day, is there is a payday someday. There is a date on God's calendar where harvest is coming. And don't make God out to be a fool to think there isn't. And the motivation is, if you understand, the farmer understands harvest is coming, guess what? He will sow. He will be working. He will get out there and sow. And so now we have all this sowing and reaping, which, by the way, feeds into the financial context of verse 6, because every time Paul brings up sowing and reaping has a financial context to it. But here Paul says, don't be deceived. Harvest time is coming. Now, there are many gardeners in the room. I'm one of them. Uh, God can be found in a garden, you know. And uh, if you've heard that poem... If next May I go out to my soil and I take one cucumber and I plant it in the soil and I think that I'm going to be able to pickle and can pickles the entire rest of the year for my family out of one garden seed, I've deceived myself. It ain't going to happen. But if I sow a lot, if I plant five or six plants, then that ensures that I'm going to feed my family. Also important and significant to this context, I don't plant a cucumber seed expecting to harvest barley. I don't plant a pumpkin seed expecting to pick figs in late fall. No, the sowing and reaping are connected. You sow one type of seed, you harvest another, which is Paul's point when he says, look, if you want to sow into works righteousness, the flesh, you're going to reap a harvest. And the harvest is literally the word, he calls it corruption, but it's the same word for destruction. Now, I'm a gardener. A few months ago, I, by the way, I read more for sentimental, not for witchery. Don't want anyone to accuse me of watching the moon to determine. But I read for fun the farmer's, the old farmer's almanac. So I kind of know when to plant my fall crop. And I planted a fall crop of collards 
and the turnips and the mustard and let, all the good stuff. And it was gorgeous. The frost hit a few weeks ago. I knew it would withstand it because collards, I, some Southern farmers told me, you want frost to hit collards because it sweetens it. And it does. Because have you ever tasted collards? I mean, you grow them, you cut them, and then throw them in the garbage. But my wife loves collard greens, so I suffer through to, so she could enjoy her collards. But I've learned you want frost to hit it to sweeten it, and it does. It sweetens collards. Well, I, uh, I made too big of a risk because I thought the other night, okay, it's getting a little cold, maybe I should cover, and I forgot to cover all my collards, all my turnips, all my everything. And I wake up the next morning and my heart sinks. All of it's ruined, just doopsy daisy. So I sowed, but I also reaped, and I reaped nothing because it was corrupt. And Paul was using that very picture to say, look, if you want to sow works righteousness, you want to sow to the flesh, you're going to reap. Harvest time is coming. But if you sow to the Spirit, if you do good to one another, you're going to reap a harvest. It's called eternal life. Look, do you count your life, if you were to die today, how have you invested your life in relationships? Have you done good to one another? And if not, then where is your 401k? What worth is your checkbook now? So don't be deceived. And finally, on the farm, very important exhortation in 9 and 10, don't give up. It's the Jimmy Valvano theology. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Um, as a farmer, if you work 50 weeks out of 52 to get to a harvest, there are times when you're going to stop and ask, is this worth it? I mean, I, my kids can't even go, the farmer would say, my kids can't even go to a lot of sporting events because I'm a dairy farmer and they got to come back and they got to milk twice a day. My entire life is built around a farm. If you're a farmer, you don't punch a time clock. It's a life. And you either love it or you'll hate it. But probably every farmer at one point or another says, I got to get up at the crack of dawn. I hurt for very little just to survive. Is it worth it? And guess what? In the farmyard of the church, to do good, many of us will ask, is this really worth it to do good? Because, Pastor Brian, I've noticed when I do good to unbelievers, they don't do good back. In fact, when I do good, now we're getting to the point in culture, when I do good, they turn around and call it bad. The good that I do, they take advantage of me. In the body of Christ, I do good. You might think, I don't get any thank yous. Some of you might say, I do good, I don't see any fruit. And so Paul writes to real saints that will be tempted, I'm tired. I'm tired of doing good. I don't see any harvest. I'm done. So you hear this, don't you, in verse 9. Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Don't give up. Keep at it. Keep working. Keep showing good. The word giving up is to lose heart, to get tired, to where you throw in the towel. Don't do it. Evidently, there were some Galatian Christians ready to throw in the towel and go back under the law. And Paul is pleading with them, don't give up. So if you're here today and you're a weary Christian and you've done good, but you don't see the payoff, that's understandable. We're in this world. Don't give up. Harvest time is coming and you'll reap from the cosmic farmer in that day. Now, as I close, so there is no mistake, particularly those of you that are just jumping into Galatians, this could be easily misunderstood, so I want to spend my closing argument making abundantly clear 
what we don't mean by goodness and what we do. Because we never want to be accused of being moralists. So let me say it as simply as possible. If you take God out of good, what do you have? You have nothing. Take God out of good and you have zero. We are extensions of the gospel. And the gospel, by definition, is good news coming from a good God. And there's not one of us in this room that would do or even think about doing good to our fellow churchmen if it weren't for a good God who came to bad people with good news. Paul says this in Galatians, but he says it almost every other letter, famously in Ephesians, when he brings up goodness and he says, it is by God's grace that we're saved through faith. This is not of your own doing, not of good works, lest any man should boast about it. We are saved by works, but it's not our works doing the saving. It's the work of another that we completely trust in his work. And in that verse, there follows another, verse 10, right after it, which says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So faith, we're saved by faith alone, but it's not a faith that is alone. That real faith produces good works. And we're compelled to taste and see that the Lord is good. So that's what I want to leave with you today. The reason you and I do good works is not to pump up our moral muscle and massage our ego. It is to do good works because how can we not? Because a good God came and did it for us. And Psalm tells us to taste and see that the Lord is good. How good is our God? Well, in a few moments, you can test him by walking out here in his landscape. If we think about that, that out of nothing came everything. And it is not without accident that on each day of creation, God looked and said, it is good every day. And then finally, it is very good. Man, God's greatest good creation, is capable of knowledge, reasonable in affairs, able to govern, at least sometimes, able to govern, giving to other creatures, discovering witty inventions, a mind to contemplate the creator, judgment to discern between right and wrong, virtue and vice, to other creatures, God only gives small doses of his good treasury, but to man, he opens up the vault and pours out his goodness. After all, we are created in his image, after his likeness. Man was not created in the image of angels, but in the image of one good God. And then this good God that created man sent man and gave man dominion over all his good creation. So if you think about it, we can take from this earth food for our stomachs, medicine for our body, materials for us to have a house to live in. We can travel the globe and see all the wonders of God's good world. And we can build relationships with one another as human beings and be benefited by their goodness to us. God did not merely erect a skeleton planet and ask us to fill in the blanks but he provided everything out of his sheer goodness to natural man. He provided food for nourishment, enjoyment for man's entertainment. He blanketed the sky with the stars, the carpeted the floor with grass. He has given us seasons for variety, cool ocean breeze for our comfort on a summer's day, a cool autumn winds ruffling the leaves to remind us he's a God of color and personality. He's given us individual snowflakes to remind us that he is a good God who is certainly not boring. 
He has given us the fresh smell of hyacinths in the spring, sun and moon to light the earth, free of charge, mountains to climb, rivers to sail, valleys to walk, fresh herbs, fruits and vegetables to entice the palate, dew between our toes, birds that sing us free every morning, medicines to aid us, clothes to wear, books to read, people to marry. Every time you and I walk into Walmart, once we get past our own anxieties about walking into such a place, then we behold God is good. Who can explain this except God is a good God. But his goodness doesn't just stop there. Not only in creation, but every one of us, from the youngest child to the oldest adult sitting, are here because God was good in redemption. He sought us when we were lost. He ransomed us when we were captives. He pardoned us when we were condemned. He raised us when we were dead. And he gave his good gift, the greatest gift, his own son. For God must be made man. Eternity must suffer death. The Lord of angels must cry in a cradle. The creator of the world must hang like a slave. Contemplate the goodness of Jesus in a womb and in the manger, in his weary steps, and in his hungry stomach, in his prostrations in the garden, in his clotted drops of blood, in his head pierced with the crown of thorns, his face besmeared with soldiers' slobber, his view, his goodness on his march to Golgotha, his sides steamed streaming with blood, view him pelted with scoffs by governors and derisions of the rabble, and see the cost of his goodness to save you out of hell and save me from eternal death. In creation, God's goodness is seen by making the sun shine to us. In redemption, his goodness is seen by making the sun die for us. And all this benefits of redemption and infinitely more come simply because he is not a bad God. He is a good one. The ability to read the Bible, every single one of us, and anywhere at any time talk with this good God. The privileges we have to worship, to sing, to give money, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to have pastors feed us the word, answer prayers, encourage one another through our gifts, forgive our sin, give us peace, hope, comfort in affliction, confidence in heaven, assurance of salvation, boldness in evangelism, and victory through the cross all come because he is a good God. And yet, there are some of his human creatures created in his image who claim he is a bad one. Thus, Paul would write in Romans chapter 2, Do you presume on the riches of the goodness of God, not knowing that is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? Do you realize this verse might be talking about some of you today? You have showed contempt for God's goodness. You have looked down your noses on the cross and his good redemption. You have rejected the goodness of God and have joined in league with hell against heaven. You have turned God's goodness on its head and called it bad. And you laugh at me and say, no, Brian, I don't do that. But Romans says you do if you do not come to Christ and repent. God's goodness is there to lead you to that redemption. One of my favorite authors and favorite stories, and I've told you this time and time again, are the Chronicles of Narnia, a series of children's books written by C.S. Lewis based on its fantasy, based on the truths of Christianity. Aslan, the golden lion, represents Christ. And in his description of that fierce and loving lion, Lewis, 
has given evidence of a remarkable understanding of the character of Jesus. In one scene, some talking beavers are describing Aslan to Lucy, Susan, and Peter, who are newcomers to the realm of Narnia. In anticipation of meeting the great Aslan the lion, they ask questions to the beavers that reveal their fears. Susan asks, oh, I thought Aslan was a man. Is he quite safe? I would feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. To which Mrs. Beaver responds, that you will, dearie, that you will, and make no mistake. Anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking are braver than most or just plain silly. To which Lucy asks, So, he isn't safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver is saying to you? Who who said anything about him being safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. On Good Friday... A good God died for bad people, and that is good news. And that's our only hope for doing good to one another. Father, I thank you for this assembly. I pray that they would join me now for the rest of our days in living out this sermon, which uh, is tough to do living in a bad world. And this bad world needs to hear the good news of the gospel desperately. I pray as we continue to worship and dine on you and this meal and what it powerfully represents about your good gospel, that we would take it and out of obedient children, we would go do good. This we pray in the name of Jesus our Lord and for his sake. Amen.